Uh, hello everybody, today the topic for discussion is scaphoid fractures. We will talk about the treatment of acute and chronic scaphoid fracture. What we will see during the course of this talk is classifications, the treatment options for acute fractures and then the summary of the important points in non-surgical and surgical management of the acute fractures. We will discuss scaphoid non-unions and the pathomechanics of it. We will also look at the treatment principles in the management of a non-union of a scaphoid fracture. Now you have a plethora of classification systems for scaphoid fractures based on location, the orientation of the fracture plane and stability, all of which play an important role in the treatment and the outcomes of this fracture. As far as location and orientation are concerned, fracture can be proximal, middle and distal and their combinations. Proximal fractures tend to be more unstable and have a tendency for non-union. Of course, not to mention the fact that the blood supply of the scaphoid is from distal to proximal. It almost is like a one-way up road where if you have a break in the middle, the proximal pole suffers from an avascular necrosis which renders the fracture uh, difficult for union. You have classification based on orientation of the fracture line. The fracture can be transverse or it can be horizontal oblique or it can be vertical oblique which is the basis for the Rusi classification which we will look into a little bit more detail as we go. The important thing to remember is that the horizontal fractures are the most stable. Uh, in a transverse fracture there can be combined shear and compressive forces and the vertical oblique fractures are the most unstable and most problematic because there is a more shearing component of the force involved in these fractures. Now, this is the Mayo classification, which is based on the stability of uh, the fracture. The table on both sides shows what a stable fracture is and what an unstable fracture is. So, by definition, if there is a displacement of more than one millimeter, if there is a carpal mal alignment, which means if you look at the lateral view of the wrist and the lunate is looking dorsally or there is a dizzy alignment, then it is an unstable fracture. The same is implied as in a capital lunate angle which is more than 15 degrees, a scaphoid lunate angle of more than 60 degrees and a lateral interscaphoid angle of more than 35 degrees. Now this implies that the fracture is broken and it is also collapsed into the characteristic humpback deformity which makes the interscaphoid angle pretty high which is more the upper limit of which is 35 degrees. If you have comminuted fractures or the fractures are a part of a perilunate dislocation, then these are unstable fractures. Now, this is the Rusi classification, which starts from the horizontal oblique picture on the left side to the transverse in the middle to the vertical oblique. And as I had mentioned before, the horizontal oblique is more stable. The transverse can be a combination of compressive forces, which is very good, and occasionally shearing forces, which is not very good. So, the transverse uh, fracture line comes somewhere in between uh, as far as the uh, stability of the fracture is concerned. Now, if you look at the vertical oblique, as the picture shows very clearly, the orientation of the fracture site uh, renders it more uh, under the influence of a shearing component of a force applied which makes it very unstable. This is the Herbert and the Fisher classification, which is one of the most popular classifications as far as scaphoid fractures are concerned. You have the type A, type B, type C and type D. The type A is stable and the acute fractures, type B is unstable acute fractures. Type C and type D are delayed and non-unions. This is a very useful classification system, but it has been criticized on the aspect that a combination of acute and uh, chronic fractures have been included because they both tend to behave completely differently. If you look at acute fracture, there are two types of acute fractures. One is the clinical scaphoid fracture, the other is the established scaphoid fracture. Now, what is a clinical scaphoid fracture? This is something we come across quite frequently. You have clinical findings, which means the person gives you a history of fall on an outstretched hand. You examine the wrist of the patient, there is tenderness, in the anatomical snuff box, if it's a middle third, it can be a tenderness in the scaphoid tubercle or it can be tenderness in the scaphoid proximal pole. But if you do x-rays, the x-rays are negative. So, this is the definition of a clinical scaphoid fracture. 
Established scaphoid fracture is a similar situation, but you have clinical and radiological evidence of a fracture of the scaphoid. Now, how do you manage a clinical scaphoid fracture? There are two ways of doing it. 